Thank you very much to Hyperledger. Thank you, Tomas, for, for hosting this. Uh, I also want to call out David Berger, who's joining the, the webinar from our team. David Berger, based in Las Vegas, uh, is our chief scientist uh, and the originator of, of many of our core technologies. Uh, what we're going to do today through this webinar uh, is present Integra's vision for universal document automation uh, using Hyperledger technology. Uh, and the, that vision is to rethink the way documents and contracts move in the world, uh, simplifying and streamlining it very much in the way that global universal credit card payment systems now operate, cell phone networks, uh, and even the internet and the World Wide Web itself. And so we're going to we're going to draw those comparisons through this webinar, walk you through the concepts, show you the technology in action explain the deployment, uh, and then give you an overview of our tech stack and take questions. So jumping right into that, most people when they think about blockchain technology are focused on payments, the, the, sort of the miracle of Bitcoin uh, and what that gave rise to in the world. And Bitcoin, of course, is just a, a data network, a distributed ledger, unique numbers, uh, but we, we use universal systems of unique numbers that are not blockchain based. Uh, and we use them in ways that have absolutely transformed the way we live. You think about cell phones as an example, you know, obviously these are very sophisticated devices, but at the heart of, of a cell phone's connection to the world, you know, is a SIM card. You know, it's a unique identity, a unique number for that phone that distinguishes each phone from every other one in the world and enables ultimately those connections, those nearly infinite connections among anyone that has one. You can see the, the, some of the stats there, 7 billion phones in use, 8 trillion text messages, and obviously a huge market. Another even more universal example probably is, is credit cards, bank cards, ATM cards. Uh, the world wasn't always this way, right? We used to use cash for things or checks even. The, the notion of universally accepted Visa cards, American Express cards, MasterCards, you know, to buy you know, a cup of coffee or, or to buy services, subscriptions, you name it. I mean, that's a relatively new phenomenon. But if you think about what's actually happening in credit card networks, again, not blockchain, but it's a unique number you know, and it's a unique proof of existence, typically via chip you know, in that plastic card. Amazing to think that unique numbers and proof of unique existence can enable global, seamless, on-demand payments. Final example, I use the, the, an image of the Hyperledger website, the internet. Right? Again, for those of you who are, who are my age and, and above, you certainly remember the time when there was no internet, there was no email. The foundation of that universal connectivity and, and connection and data transfer, of course, is unique addresses, IP addresses, numbers. The fact that we can uniquely connect to these numbers you know, around the world, and each number, of course, each you know, through DNS you know, and, and domain name registry confirms identity, you know, allows this trusted transfer of information. Incredibly efficient, changed the world, obviously. But that brings us to contracts. Almost all value in the world, hundreds of trillions of dollars, euros, yen, won, moves via contract. The, and it could be as simple as you know, when, you, when you press a button on your screen to accept cookies, you're accepting the contract terms of that website. And it could be as elaborate or as dramatic as a hundred billion dollar M and A transaction. Contracts define ownership and the transfer of value. In the blockchain era, most focus has been on how to automate those contracts, how to digitize them, smart contracts, how to put them on blockchain. But our insight is that we have a current world where pieces of paper, PDFs digital documents 
that are not authenticated, that are not identified, are controlling all the value in the world, or virtually all the value in the world. Yet there's no universal numbering system, no proof of existence or authentication. So if we think back to my cell phone example or the website example, IP addresses uh, or credit cards, there's clear precedent that adding unique numbers and authentication to universally used things creates incredible transformative efficiency. Integra is just following that pattern. Best examples, again, cell phones, credit cards, and the internet. What we're gonna show you through the rest of this presentation is how we can rethink a document in a way that makes it feel like a cell phone, the, which may seem like a crazy example, but I think it'll make sense as we step through it. Uh, and, to, and to walk you through exactly how that works and how that actually is similar and how that can really change the world. I'm gonna turn this over to Mike Renault uh, to walk you through the demonstration. Mike, take it away. Thanks, David. I'm getting my screen share up and uh, all right, good. So for cell phones to receive calls and messages, the cell phone network or cellular network needs to know where to route the call or message. The cell phone has the SIM card, like David had mentioned, with a unique identity, and the identity is linked to the phone number. That way, when the cellular phone network receives a call to the phone number, it can route the call to the cell phone with that SIM card. To make a document behave the same way, we need to give it a unique number, just like the SIM card. Adding this ID, we record that identification of the Integra ID, as we call it, for the unique number on the Integra Ledger blockchain. Because documents are purely digital with no hardware-based security like a chip or a SIM card, one additional step should be performed, which is also registering the hash or digital fingerprint of the document along with that unique Integra ID. Together, those two items confirm the uniqueness of the document and the Integra ID becomes the address for that document, similar to the SIM card on the cell phone for the unique address. So a document that's registered on, Integra, on the Integra Ledger blockchain with an Integra ID and a hash is what we call a smart document. This is different from a smart contract in that a smart contract is code on the blockchain itself. Whereas a smart document is a normal document whose uniqueness and authenticity is recorded on the Integra Ledger blockchain. So I'm gonna go into this now and show you guys. Sorry, sorry, these are the slides I was supposed to be showing you while I was going through those. Anyway, I'm gonna go through an example now of how we go, how we basically register documents onto or create a smart document with a unique identifier. So first step here, we're using a tool called the Integra Workbench, which is software that makes it easy for us to show what we're doing without being in a production environment where in a production environment, this would be layered on top of additional software in what we consider a blockchain authentication layer. So the first step I'm gonna do here to create a document is I dragged and dropped a basic PDF document, as you can see here, into this page, which is our create page on the Integra Workbench. And the first few steps are, I'm gonna add some metadata to it, which will be stored in the document and not on the blockchain. Go ahead and do today, description here. It allows you to also add additional fields or values for whatever you may need. If it's a contract or a mortgage, these could be uh, fields that are pertinent to the contract itself. And you'll see why they become important here in just a little bit. The other thing that we allow is standardized codes, such as Chancery Lane, Sally. And what these allow are standardized metadata to be put into the uh, smart document as well. So uh, I'll do manslaughter, I guess that's a good one. And uh, we'll search on it and select one. And you'll see it puts in the unique code for Sally along with the term 
voluntary manslaughter. So I'm going to go ahead and create this smart document. And what this is doing is it's taking that information that is in these fields and it's creating a document that's registered with that unique identifier on the Integra blockchain. And you'll see now we have this QR code that was not there. I'm going to make really quickly open it up in Adobe Acrobat so we can show you guys what has been what's happened to the document. You'll see it's the same document as before. But when we come in here and we look at the metadata or the custom properties, you'll see that we now have an Integra ID. That is the unique number that's similar to the credit card number or the SIM card number. Also in here, it stores all the other information that we had stored from that form. This would typically be generated in a contract management system or any other way that companies typically generate documents. It'll embed the, the information within the document and not on the blockchain, a very important distinguishing factor. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this QR code. You can also scan it with a cell phone. And what this is going to do is it's going to take us to a page where we can verify that this document was registered on the Integra blockchain, along with the uh, ability to check that it has not been modified or tampered with. So here is the Integra ID, as we saw back here in the custom metadata. So that's consistent. We've got that. That's a good start. All right, we've also got the document hash that can be seen here. And that's of the document, the final document. You'll see the transaction ID, which I'm gonna go ahead and click on right now. And this is gonna open up our version of Blockchain Explorer, which is a fork of Hyperledger's Blockchain Explorer. So I'll come down here in the transaction. Nope, wrong click. And I'm gonna go into the actual transaction and show you the data that's written. So you'll see here that we have the Integra ID, the same one that is a unique number that I showed you in an Acrobat and on the verified page. Also, we have the transaction ID, which was just linked to and clicked on. So this points to this transaction within a block on our blockchain and also the value. So there's no proprietary or private information stored on the blockchain as is our company policy. And it's never a good standard practice to put that type of information on the blockchain. Anyway, so now I'm gonna come back here and the second step into this is we need to verify that the document has not changed since it was created. One other thing I wanted to show you is you'll see here that when we created that document, we appended an underscore smart document to the original file name. It's another indicator that this is a smart document and not just a regular document. So we're calculating the hash of the file locally and it's making a call to the blockchain to check that that identifier and that hash are unique and matching what were originally generated when the contract was created or document created. So here you'll see that it was indeed an exact match of the document that is registered with our blockchain. So another thing I want to show you here is you'll see that this is also the same metadata. It was extracted from the document. It was not pulled from the blockchain as I showed you that none of it's stored on the blockchain. So it's extracted from the document itself once it's been proved as authentic and um, untampered with. So you'll see now it's in standardized JSON format. So this can be automated into other systems. Um, it can be mapped into various other pieces of software. And we'll show you how you do that here in a little bit. Um, so now the, let's see, the last thing I wanted to show you here, we showed the verification. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of sidestep this, and I don't have the ability to do it live, but I've got a video of me associating now that this document, the key part here is the document has been registered on our network, just like a cell phone with a SIM card. It's been registered on the Integra blockchain. So now it can be communicated with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and show you a video of how this QR code here can be scanned with one of the apps that we have, which is the Integra Switchboard and Portfolio. 
and that will allow communication, messaging, and other things. So we're going to go ahead and show you how easy it is to associate one of these documents with our portfolio, which was previously called Wallet. So you have to bear with me. So we're going to scan the QR code there, and it's going out, and it's basically allowing me to create a meaningful name for the document in my own personal wallet. So this is not going to be stored anywhere but on my personal device, similar to the switchboard, which is more for companies' registration of documents. So once you've added it, once you scan the QR code, you'll see that the document shows up under your documents section. And you'll see how there's a slight delay there for the creation ID or for creation date, Integra ID, transaction and hash. That's because it's actually checking the blockchain for those values. The last thing you can do is now you can share it with friends and colleagues or counterparties for the document. And what this will allow is once there's a connection established, it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, end to end encrypted connection for document messaging, for attaching files to that, for communicating with the document, um, similar to the way a cell phone does it. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the next slide. Oops, sorry, this one. This is basically an example of how you would communicate with like a document messaging, similar to a cell phone messaging. And so I'll show you a quick video of that. Once it's in your wallet or portfolio, excuse me, you'll see that we can associate various other documents with it. We actually can message it and you'll see that there's a slight delay once we uh, send the message because it's going out to the, in the blockchain to figure out where that document resides, like communicating with another cellular device. It's got to go check the cellular network to see where that message or call should be delivered. So basically the Integra switchboard, which is the enterprise version of our portfolio, is software that'll let you connect the documents, messaging capabilities to other software applications at the enterprise level. And this is where the heart of universal document automation will be enabled. The switchboard will allow configuration, as you see here on this slide, of various third-party applications, and it'll allow routing. So the switchboard is exactly what it sounds like. It's a switchboard. It's a directory, the phone directory of all the documents or Integra IDs for documents within the organization. Every time a registered document with Integra Ledger, the Integra ID is added to the switchboard to make it aware of that document and will allow for data routing, automation, mapping to other parties, et cetera. So also one thing I forgot to mention is in the switchboard, it'll allow configuration of other software, um, any OAuth, Exchange, Dropbox, DocuSign, all these on the right side, it'll allow for automation to be triggered within those. It doesn't matter what software we're using to store or manage the documents, the switchboard will basically route them to that software and the counterparties or people on both ends of documents can have different softwares. It's not, a, not an issue. We're enabling universal document automation between organizations. Um, with that, I think I got everything. I'd like to pass it back to David. You're on mute, David. What we're doing here is we're, we're, we're establishing a data channel. Uh, so you've got the party on one side, which could be using our software, Integra Portfolio or Integra Switchboard, or, or they could have custom built that into their existing software. And then you have the other party on the other side of this, you know, which could be you know, a company, a vendor, a client, you know, anyone really, anyone on, their, on the other side of the contract, implementing the same Integra enabled software. And so you have identity on one side, identity on the other side, and the identity of the confirmed identity of the document that connects them. The, so the magic here is simply three numbers, blockchain authenticated on Integra, that establish that unique connection, peer-to-peer, party-to-party 
you know, embedded in that is the reference to the contract. What this does, I mean, it's a very simple idea. I mean, it, it's, but profound in its impact. What it means is that rather than having to use all sorts of disparate systems, email, text messaging, custom software integration, cloud intermediaries to do, do data transformations, expensive, you know, with security risks, complexity. Uh, I mean, this is part of the reason the world defaults to email, you know, as the universal way to, to transmit documents and information is because every other way is so messy. What we're showing here or demonstrating is that using simple identifiers and the ability to authenticate you know, the provenance of a document or contract enables a nearly perfectly uh, connected data channel relative to that. And through that data channel, you can connect software on either side. And so you, you can move invoices, you can move legal notices, purchase orders, almost anything. Yeah, at some point, we think even payments you know, can be routed you know, using this unique peer-to-peer -peer data channel that we're creating. It's universally applicable. We think it fits the pattern uh, that I mentioned previously of cell phones, credit cards, and IP addresses. Very simple idea, add unique numbers, add proof of existence, provenance, authenticity, uh, and you, get, you enjoy the same sort of universal data interactions that we enjoy with these other technologies that we're all used to every day. I'm gonna kick it back to Mike uh, quickly to talk about how this is implemented. It's, it's startlingly simple. Uh, I'll keep control of this, Mike, so you can just talk over it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to go into a few little uh, little technical details for those people who are here to hear about Hyperledger, which is great. So basically, all our infrastructure currently is on Hyperledger uh, Fabric 2.1. We're able to run nodes on-prem for various companies. And once they're behind the firewall, we're allowing them to access the APIs. There's two sets of APIs, which we'll get to on the next slide, um, that will allow the endpoints to be in their firewall. And we only have to expose two ports to the outside world currently, which is 7051 and 7050. So this will allow the entire node and API calls to reside on the infrastructure of the organization hosting that node. And nothing will be open to the outside world. Eventually this will all move to in browser, which David Berger will talk to here shortly. And like we talked about earlier, none of this information except the hashes and identifiers, which we don't control the identifiers, the organization generates them and stores them. None of that information is stored on the blockchain. So everything, we don't compromise data, privacy, and or security. You can go to the next slide, David. So all of this is accomplished with relative ease with basically chain code APIs, which interact with the blockchain themselves, which are on the left-hand side. And those are basically registering identities, integra IDs and hashes, and then various ways to look them up. And this will change over time, but right now that's the way they're done. And then the other thing that, the other component that we created is a Dockerized container where organizations can host it on their internal sites where they don't need to know the inner workings of PDFs, Word documents, and how to store metadata or extract metadata or any of those complicated operations or to query the blockchain for that. Basically, they can call these simple endpoints, which I consider helper APIs. So you don't have to do the, you know, do deep research on how the inner workings of a PDF document work. Yeah, Mike, uh -huh. just, to, just to interject here, the you know, emphasizing the simplicity of this, you know, in a world where Almost all software is trying to solve complexity with more complexity. Our insight is on the left-hand side, you register an identity, you register proof of existence, record the hash. You can then query it and get that, get that identity and check it. That's the identity piece of it. And on the right-hand side, uh, for those, those helper API calls, those are just simple functions 
to manipulate the documents to inject the identity, add the QR code, simple stuff, and, and register and, and register it on the uh, blockchain. Yeah, and yeah. and and as Mike mentioned, like all of this stays on your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There was a question in the, in the chat about where the documents stored. The documents stay where they are now. You know, all we're suggesting is that software should become aware that registered documents exist within the system. The, but fundamentally, the documents stay in their existing applications, in their existing storage. All we're doing is writing that proof of existence and identity to Integra, which then enables all this other functionality, much in the way, again, that universal you know, SIM cards, credit card numbers, IP addresses, universalizes data transfer. I'll move to the next slide. Yeah, and uh, through two of our applications, they allow basically the ability to track and have associated documents and communication between these documents occur seamlessly. And with the Integra switchboard, it'll allow organizations quickly and easily to configure to their existing software needs or platform. And it prevents organizations from having to have the exact same software for document or for automation to occur. Yeah, so, we, so very much like a, a, you know, back to the credit card, you know, credit card example, the, the, the act of possessing a credit card, I mean, fundamentally, you just, you have a piece of plastic, right? It's, it's inert for what it is. It doesn't do anything. Uh, and so you need to have enabling software, say in a cat, you know, point of sale system, you know, that's able to process that number and, and transmit it to a bank or, or someone on the other side. So what we've done with Integra Portfolio, Integra Switchboard, is create some out-of-the-box enabling software, you know, to make it easier for organizations to connect their existing systems, you know, to this document identity system, you know, to facilitate uh, this seamless peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, data connection uh, scheme. So that's what that is. It's not necessary to use Integra Portfolio or Integra Switchboard. Everything can be done custom using those straightforward APIs uh, that we listed before. Uh, but again, we, we have the software just to make it easier uh, out of the box for organizations to add this functionality uh, to their existing software. That's part of what's amazing about this. Most contract automation or document automation uh, is specific to an individual organization. You have to buy the software, you have to configure it, it's it's complicated, it's expensive, you know, and furthermore, it, it doesn't typically allow you to seamlessly interact with anyone else outside of the organization. The This is a completely different way of thinking about it. Again, it's, it's, it's about identity, you know, as the way to connect um, organizations and, and create the potential for automation, you know, rather than creating complex intermediary software you know, to do the same thing, you know, in a traditional cloud type of, of technology. David, I wanted to say one more thing and then I'll pass it back to you. Um, we've had integrations with existing software that have taken a matter of hours to actually calculate hashes right to the blockchain and check those hashes. So it's not, we're not saying overhaul software, it's very easy to implement. And that's all I need to say. Thanks. So, so for the final segment of this, I wanted to um, bring it back to David Berger, uh, who you know originated many of these ideas and many of these concepts. Uh, the company launched Integra in 2017, uh, and David Berger there was was with me at the beginning, uh, thinking through these technology patterns. I'd like him to just talk through our technology stack, um, which is completely hyperledger-centric. Hyper uh, David, take it away. Great. Uh, so Mike talked about the current, uh, the current system using Hyperledger 2.1, and uh, we're not fundamentally changing the way we're doing. We're adding a lot of layers underneath. A lot of them actually apply to the IT people and the programmers dealing with it. So fundamentally, things don't change. There's just kind of a, a level of improvement. So Hyperledger has a project called Firefly, uh, and Firefly was written by the folks at Kaleido and contributed. 
And it, it creates an infrastructure of plumbing to make a lot of this stuff easier. So you have a Hyperledger uh, super node that provides a lot of functionality, including connection to, you can use Ethereum, but uh, there's uh, out of the box support for using Hyperledger fabric, which we'll still be using, although we're gonna bump to 2.4 uh, in the next release, the current release. Uh, and the, the guys who wrote the software, Kaleido, actually have uh, a software as a service hosting service, which uh, we'll be switching over to. And I was able to do a beta where I spun up a network on Kaleido and in under an hour, we're uh, able to hit, uh, hit our APIs. The other thing that, um, that Firefly provides is a, a much easier programming model. So the API Mike showed, um, the API layer is a traditional uh, software as a service API written in Node, and it's using the Hyperledger SDK that's out there, which, which is pretty easy to use. You can write in JavaScript uh, uh, or Java or Go rather than having to hit uh, Solidity, the more complicated languages from Ethereum. But there's still a layer where you have to hit the SDKs and then it talks um, it talks to the chain code, the code that's sitting in the ledger. Uh, one of the really nice things that Firefly, uh, Firefly and Kaleido have provided was a really nice API where uh, the middleware just, uh, it doesn't require you to write specific, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't, require you to write specific code for everything you're going to do. There's uh, one nice API call where you basically say, execute this piece of code or a chain code API Mike showed uh, and not have to write one for everyone. I, guys, just if it's not clear, if you're not a programmer, put the snooze button on. Uh, th this is really the ultra geeky and, uh, and technical stuff. Now, one other thing we're layering in um, is you, you'll notice we didn't really talk about um, digitally signing things or uh, and you kind of might wonder why Aries is up there. Uh, so Mike mentioned that a smart contract is a PDF uh, where you're recording the hash and an ID, uh, the proof of existence up on the ledger and storing the data, the metadata within the PDF. I, it, there's some more under the hood stuff that you're able to do, uh, including storing signing data. Mike mentioned in general, uh, you can store metadata. Well, one of the pieces of metadata you can store is a, uh, uh, is a self-sovereign identity, a non-cred. So, um, you know, if you don't know what a non-creds are, go and read the Hyperledger documentation. They're really cool. Uh, and you'll notice that a non-creds itself became a hyperledger uh, standard recently. So we actually will allow you to sign a document, but not in the Adobe fashion, which is expensive, but in a much easier way and use uh, embed the non-credentials in the document itself. And to get super geeky where almost no one will care about what I'm about to say, but I'll say it anyway, we're doing something really interesting where uh, the DID of the document resolves to, um, uh, instead of a location of a file somewhere up on the net, actually refers uh, to the proof within the document itself, which is something that um, we're doing that's really cool. Uh, anyway, uh, one other, the last cool thing I'll mention is that most people are using the uh, Aries with Indy, which is the Hyperledger purpose-built uh, blockchain for identity. There is mention out there, you could potentially use Fabric, but no one really is except uh, we will be. So we have functioning, uh, functioning betas right now of a blockchain where we're using the integral ledger uh, to back Ari so you can do a non-credentials there. So basically that, that's just some of the stuff I care about. Uh, it will all be coming um, 
in the next uh, release uh, somewhere in the future, although it doesn't really fundamentally change anything David or David, uh, David or Mike talked about. So that's it for me. Thanks, David. <clears throat> so we've been working on this project, like I said, for since 2017. I think that makes this the seventh year or something. This is um, a long, long lived project. Uh, some of you who know us know that we also founded the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium with about 350 uh, members around the world. We're also the founder of the Global Legal Hackathon, which is the largest legal innovation event in the world, uh, involving about 20,000 people in 75 countries. And so we've really worked to build global ecosystem uh, and consensus around the use of this, this what we think of as brain-dead simple uh, technology pattern that, again, just follows other precedents. Uh, but again, we've been working on this for six, seven years. We have dozens of global organizations uh, in, in some stage of testing or deployment uh, for this. Uh, one of the questions in the comments. Um, we see this as, as much as a um, as much as it's a technology innovation, and we think a great one with uh, you know kind of the critical uh, hyperledger components, uh, which has been fantastic for us. Um, but almost more than that, it's a social phenomenon, uh, very much like Bitcoin in the early years, where you're like, what's Bitcoin? What's blockchain? You know, there's stories of people trying to buy, you know, or I guess the first pizza that was purchased for, I forget, 10,000 Bitcoin or something. Uh, in the early days, why does anyone care about putting a number on a document? You know, a, a question I, I commonly get is, what does it do? The... Yeah. And if you spin back a couple of decades and think about cell phones, credit cards, ATM, so on and so forth, these things weren't universal. And today we just assume they're just part of the fabric of life. You can get online and connect to anything instantly. You can call anyone in the world. You can go anywhere in the world and get a phone call. We, we assume it, it almost feels like it's always been that way. Um, but think about the, the profound transformation from that universal connectivity, again, all based on systems of identity, really. I mean, yes, there's a lot of fancy enabling technology. We have fancy, fancy enabling technology. But at the, at, at the heart of it, it's just identity. And the technology you know, that specializes you know, in identity is blockchain. We're using that, you know, as we said, to simulate in a certain way what a SIM card does with a cell phone and applying that to documents. Simple idea, uh, as we get more and more adoption, you know, hopefully this will become universal and hopefully the day will come when, when we can interact with contracts, documents, related payments, automations, just as seamlessly, just as easily, you know, as we currently do with those other technologies. You know, Having concluded with that, I'd like to invite any of you that are interested in, in uh, working with us, uh, and that could be individually or as your organization, uh, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, our contact information is on the slide here. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with a lot of global scale organizations, uh, and so there, there is ample room for collaborations. And again, we do this worldwide. So wherever you're located, uh, we'd love to meet you. We'd love to work with you. Tomas, back to you. Great, thank you so much, David, David, and Mike. So we do have one hand raised, so it's Arun. Uh, and Arun, I will unmute you now. So feel free to talk and ask your questions. And then we do have some more questions in the Q&A, and I think we can get to those as well. So Arun, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, that was a really nice presentation. Uh, uh, really overwhelmed by the way you guys have shown and you know really see the importance of uh, how you know document is i mean how we can uh, you know doc management is done we have seen multiple places but this seems to be a very good you know uh, platform i just have one question is this open sourced i mean like multiple this of this hyperledger thing are all open source we can go ahead and contribute so whatever you have done is it open sourced or uh, is it like like you have restricted it, uh, the contribution since you said that you are accepting, you are willing to work with people. So how are you, you know, 
taking it ahead. So up to, and, and David Berger, you can jump in in a second. I'll, I'll answer it broadly. Uh, we, we have, it's, uh, we're using obviously open source technology in it. Up to this point, to get to a, a sufficient level of maturity and functionality that we could, in fact, this is the, this is the very first um, quasi-technical webinar I think we've ever done. We've done some other, other uh, specific talks on parts of the technology, but we've never presented it in this holistic fashion. Uh, it's our view that absolutely um, this, this you know, will be fully open source for development, edition, so on and so forth. Underneath it is the Integral Ledger blockchain, um, you know, which is is you know fee per transaction. But in terms of all the technologies around it, from wallet software, for example, helper apps. Um, I mean, it's it's there's there's a reason. You know, we found the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium and the Global Legal Hackathon interact and interact with so many uh, developers and innovators around the world. And that's that's to collaborate, collaborate, learn, develop. As we go forward, uh, we'll be much more explicit, you know, about kind of the, the approach to uh, open source development, contributions to the project, that sort of thing. Up to this point, uh, it has not been open source in in that traditional sense. Hopefully, that answers your question. I would reach yeah. out to reach out directly to me or David Berger on the uh, if you want to learn more. Definitely, my, yeah. My right. my one addition is that in the in the spirit of being brutally simple and with some of the advancements in the libraries and stuff, if you ask ChatGPT to write uh, the backend system that we showed, it could knock it out very quickly and it would be close. This is not about, we're not a technology company, although we have some really cool technology. Uh, we're a network services, uh, services company and uh, uh, We'll, we'd absolutely, we have shared in technical demos, uh, everything that, uh, that we're doing, any, any competent uh, blockchain programmer wouldn't even really like ask, they would just go, wow, I hadn't thought about that. Okay. Okay, thank you, that answers. Thank you for your question, Arun, and thank you, David and David for answering. So we do have a couple of more questions in the Q&A box. Would you like to take them one by one? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I was about to type them, but I'll just, so the question is, are currently, are currently are you only targeting law firms? What about the mortgage industry? So we, interestingly, our, our most noteworthy first mover early adopters are Hogan Levels, giant you know, global law firm, uh, and BNP Paribas in their real estate division. Um, we uh, uh, have significant focus on real estate. We, but we we interact with some of the biggest banks, insurance companies. I mean, what are, the technology is really it's a universal thing. We've used, we've started within the legal industry because the because lawyers tend to draft or touch almost every contract of significance. You know, and so the legal industry operates as a horizontal uh, from which you know, we can then create collaborations in literally every industry. So by, by historical coincidence, uh, we uh, happen to have done a lot in real estate. Uh, we're very interested in that industry and our first uh, deployments uh, are in real estate. Uh, but you'll see, you'll see things coming uh, that some of which have already been announced uh, with respect to ESG. Yeah, and so and the, and the concept there is is if you're using if you're trying to to I mean, ESG is a messy problem, right? And there are companies trying to create fancy new software to figure it out. Our view is using identities. You should be able to to catalog and move ESG information firm to firm related to contracts. So it's 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 intellectual property. It's supply chain, banking, insurance. It's everything, uh, and we're working with everyone. Next question. Um, how do you manage revisions and addenda to your previously registered contract? So we are not a document management system, right? We are a, a document uh, identity system. The, uh, and so how people implement this within their existing software or, or patterns of, of document management or collaboration is up to them. So we've actually, we've actually built you know, a demo that builds this right into 
Microsoft Word. You know, so you can have successive hashes of successive versions. You know, and, and we see a future where potentially this enables universal collaboration, say if Google Docs to Microsoft Word and others, uh, using identities uh, to help you know, uh, create the connection and translation of data without having, having to actually commingle or share the document. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers that. So we're, 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 we're agnostic as to revision you know, revise it, you can, you can hash and ID the revision. Within that revision, you can embed the identity of the predecessor. I mean, there are various patterns that we think make that pretty exciting. Uh, David, very quickly, if you create a revision, it gets a new ID, it's a different uh, document. Uh, can you tie these IDs together? Sure, they're patterns, uh, you can store it as metadata on the blockchain, although Mike alluded to that's not always the best idea, but we support it. You can embed the IDs in the metadata of the smart document, which is a pattern we really push, or you can, as David alluded to in, in uh, enterprise integration, you can store you know, within uh, Salesforce or whatever software you're using, the IDs and relate the documents together there. So I, that's a slightly, a uh, more technical explanation. So going to the next question. Um, so Dave partially answered that. Is the document storage handled through IPFs? We don't care. You can do it there. You can do it in, in your C drive. Uh, again, we're just registering proof of existence and creating identifiers for documents. So documents can be stored anywhere uh, you want. This is critical to the system. It's non-disruptive to current software, current usage. Uh, all we're doing is adding this, this uh, blockchain anchored identifier. Uh, next question, do you anticipate collaboration with Law as Code initiatives? So we've spoken at Codex uh, a couple of times, and I assume you're referring to Stanford. Um, the We think what we're doing is actually part of the answer to the challenges in you know, the smart contracts world, for example. Smart contracts need to work on trusted agreed data. Uh, what we're doing here in adding digital trust to kind of the traditional document layer, which is kind of everything at the moment, um, allows, um, in a way, Integra to be like the ultimate oracle. So if you're, if you're moving data from, again, the trillions of documents and you want to perform operations, you know, automated operations and smart contracts, we think Integra infrastructure is profound in what that enables. Um, and just in general, anything where you need to need, need you're, you're going towards um, law as code, machine processing, um, automations, whether whether smart contract based or just traditionally based, anything that that distills data to something that's trusted and structured is helpful. And I think we we uh, make a big contribution to that. Hopefully, that answers the question. Um, what security do users have that the information is still there five years from now? Um, the couple, I mean, a couple answers to this, and David Berger, feel free to chime in. Um, the ledger, you know, the Integra ledger, if you think about it, is just IDs and hashes. It's really simple stuff. The, it's publicly available. You could copy the ledger. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, I mean, anyone, any could take it, take it. I mean, so for our first organizations, you know, part of the selling point with them is if Integra disappears, you know, and they've brought their clients into this technology pattern, provided they possess, you know, a copy of those numbers, they can continue to operate um, using similar technology with their universe of clients. The, the a critical thing here is Integra is not moving value. So you don't have that security risk and complexity. Uh, and, and we're not intended to be performing automated operations. In other words, smart contracts or chain code in this case. The, it's a very, very simple idea. David Berger has also uh, experimented with, with redundancy uh, on uh, Amazon's QLDB. Uh, I believe it is, 
the again, it's just it's a long list of numbers. You can copy it, you can store it. And it's our view that with the many organizations involved in this, uh, there will be a huge amount of redundancy. So I don't think that's going to be a worry. It's not, it has not been a concern uh, of any of the big organizations that are involved. Yeah, actually, David, not only have we played with uh, the redundancy, one of the first uh, real world uses of Integra was our QWERTY AI does uh, California workers comp uh, claim. So if someone gets hurt at Amazon in California, there's a fairly good chance uh, it's the hash of the documents will hit the ledger. Uh, they have a functioning Amazon QLDB acting as a, uh, as a backup. Uh, last question. Um, you have mentioned areas and the non-creds who would be the holder of the, the verified credentials, the person uploaded the document or the parties involved in the doc? Wondering since there are usually at least two parties in legal docs. David Berger, do you want to take that? Well, it's, it's the creator of the doc. Uh, so we, we have functioning demos. Um, we have functioning demos where you, when you drag the doc into the browser, as Mike alluded to, uh, we're doing a lot of processing in the next version within the browser itself using WASM and various technologies. And you have the ability with, uh, within the browser, within uh, the app Mike was showing or the live apps where you can click a button and it uh, brings up a QR code. You can then take the wallet Mike showed and scan the QR code and open up uh, open up a uh, channel between the browser and the wallet, and the wallet can then sign the hash or send over a non-credential information to embed uh, in the document. And again, since I, you know, gonna push uh, technology and all, and uh, this is kind of a geeky detail, uh, we're going to port the wallet over to the Aries Bifold wallet. So again, another Hyperledger technology and use uh, AFJ, which is the JavaScript implementation of Aries to actually uh, to do all of the work necessary. Uh, so the creator of the document, who, remember whoever, cre when you create the document, uh, it gets hashed and that becomes the ID. Uh, so the person um, embedding the information uh, is the one responsible for hashing it and then calling the API uh, that Mike uh, showed to actually record the data. Okay. That's my long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, David. Um, I see we do have some more questions, but unfortunately we ran out of time. So um, thank you very much, David, David and Mike. And uh, for those of you who still have questions open, please feel free to reach out to Integra Ledger team and you have the contact information over here. And you all of the slides will also be uploaded to our webinar uh, library. So you're always welcome to check them out there as well. Once again, David, David and Mike, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing all of this great information. And thank you everybody who joined us live to, for this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, before we say goodbye, I would like to invite you to join our Hyperledger Discord, where we, can where we have a lot of real-time engagements and you can contribute and also get good information about our projects, about our special interest groups, our regional chapters, and more. We have some other upcoming webinars. So in April, we have Instant about enabling portable KYC for financial institutions. So please go to Hyperledger events to register there. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you again to our panelists for this great presentation. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it and thank you again for joining and hopefully see you again at our next Hyperledger in-depth webinar. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.